Hi, I'm Professor Baldwin, and today I'm going to teach you an introduction to polynomial functions. A polynomial function, p of x, is written in this format, where these a's are coefficients, which are real numbers, and we have the variable x that has exponents, which are whole numbers. Polynomial functions are continuous which means when you're drawing the graph, you don't have to lift up your pencil, so there's no breaks or holes, and there's also no sharp corners, so it's smooth. Now let's talk about some of the terminology you're gonna need when we talk about polynomial functions. First, you have the leading coefficient. This is your first non-zero coefficient, a. The leading term is when you write your terms in descending order, it's the very first term that includes the leading coefficient, a, and the variable. The degree is the highest degree of any of the terms, n. Let's look at four different examples. First, we have the constant function, f of x equals eight. This is degree zero because there's no variable. The leading term, well, there's only one term, and it's eight and the leading coefficient, the real number associated with that term, is also eight. Next, we have a linear function, two-thirds x plus five. Notice that it's written in descending order. The degree is one, because the exponent on the x is one. The leading term is two-thirds x. The leading coefficient is just the real number part, so it's two-thirds. Next, we have a quadratic, negative four x squared minus x plus three. Here, we have a degree of two because it's x squared. Our leading term is negative four x squared. You include the negative sign. The leading coefficient is just the negative four. Last, we have a cubic. This is degree three because of the x cubed. The leading term is x cubed, or you could even write it as one x cubed. That might help you so that you remember that it does have a leading coefficient of one. Now, why do we need to know this? Well. The degree and the leading coefficient help us determine the end behavior of the graph. That's what this leading term test is. It's telling us what this chart is showing. So on the top here, you see a of n is greater than zero, a of n is less than zero. Remember, this is our leading coefficient. So if we have a positive leading coefficient, we'll look in this first column. If we have a negative leading coefficient, we look in the last column. And then to determine which cell, we want to know about n. n is our degree. So if we have an even degree with a positive leading coefficient, we know that the left end and the right end are both going to point up. But if we have an even degree, and a negative leading coefficient, then both ends point down. Notice the next one, this is an odd degree and a positive leading coefficient. The left end points down, the right end points up. Let's look at an example. So here we need to determine the end behavior of the graph of the function. Notice that this function is already factored for us. So what we need to do to find that leading term is multiply the leading terms for all of these factors. We're multiplying negative four x, we're multiplying two x squared, and we're multiplying x to the fourth. You have to include these exponents. Now, when we multiply these, we can multiply our coefficients, negative four and two, which is negative eight. And then we combine our um, variables, x times x squared times x to the fourth, 
is x to the seventh. Okay, so looking at our degree, we have a degree seven, right? Our exponent is seven, and that is an odd number. And our coefficient is negative eight. So we have an odd negative. An odd negative is going to be this situation where the left goes up, the right goes down. Now, talk to your teacher to find out how they want you to, to answer a question like this. Some are okay if you draw a picture that the left end goes up, the right end goes down. Remember these squigglies? We don't know what's happening in the middle. It can go up and down multiple times in there. We just care about the end behavior. Some teachers may want you to say that the left end is up and the right is down. Personally, I like you to be specific. That left side is saying that as x approaches negative infinity, right, this direction is negative x, so you're approaching negative infinity, that function here, m of x, is going up, which is approaching positive infinity. Where on the other side, as x approaches positive infinity, right, this is our positive end of the x-axis, our function is going down, so it is approaching negative infinity. Okay, we also need to talk about the zeros of a polynomial function. The zeros, which are also sometimes referred to as roots of a function, are the x value of the x-intercept. So you find those by solving f of x equals zero for x. So you're going to factor your polynomial and then use the zero product property to find those zeros. Now multiplicity is the number of times a factor appears in the factored form. And we'll look at some more examples, but if you have a perfect square trinomial, like x plus one squared, this has a multiplicity of two because that zero happens two times. Let's look at an example on how you actually find the zeros of a function of this polynomial. Well, we have a three term polynomial, so we're going to try to factor it. Remember when you factor, you look for a GCF first. Here we have a GCF of negative three X. And when you factor that out, you're left with a polynomial of two X squared plus three X minus 20. So we wanna see if we can factor this remaining polynomial. So are there two numbers that multiply to a times c, negative 40, but also add to our b, which is three. How about eight and negative five? So let's keep our GCF, and we can rewrite that middle term as plus eight x minus five x. Now we have four terms, so we can group and factor. So keep that GCF. Our first group of terms, they have two X in common, and that leaves behind X plus four. And we can factor out negative five from the second two, and we have X plus four. Now we look at those groups and we end up with a final factored form of negative three X times X plus four times two X minus five. And remember we're solving this equal to zero. So that's where you use that zero product property. So we wanna know negative three X equals zero. Well, that happens when X equals zero. We want X plus four equals zero. Subtract four from both sides, and that zero is x equals negative four. And our last one, two x minus five equals zero. We'll add five, two x equals five. Divide by two, 
and we have x equals 5 halves. So our zeros here are x equals 0, x equals negative 4, and x equals 5 halves. Now, what are the multiplicities of each of these? Go back and look at our factored form. Each of those zeros only happens one time, so these are all a multiplicity of one, right? It only happens once. So why do we care about zeros and why do we care about the multiplicity of a zero? Well, remember the zeros are the x-intercepts for our polynomial. The multiplicity tells us what happens at that point. So we can have what's called a touch point or a cross point. If the zero is an odd multiplicity, like these that we just found that are multiplicity of one, these are cross points, which means if this is our x-axis, when our graph comes down or up to this x-intercept, it's going to cross. That's what a cross point is, where a zero multiplicity, or a zero of even multiplicity will have a touch point. So if this is our x-intercept right here, our graph is going to touch and then turn around. So it doesn't cross the x-axis. It touches and goes back. So multiplicity and zeros help us see what's happening to that graph in between the end behavior that we just found. So let's put all of this together, our end behavior and our intercepts, and try to graph a polynomial. So here we're gonna follow these six steps and we'll go through each of them as we work on example three. Step one is to use that leading term to determine the end behavior of the graph. So step one, our leading term. Remember, we're gonna multiply all of those together. One fourth times x times x times x. So we have one fourth x cubed. Our leading coefficient is positive and our degree is odd. So we have a positive odd. If you go back to that chart on the first page, positive odd, the left is going down and the right is going up. Here we're not asked to explain the end behavior, so I'm good just leaving it like this just so I have a visual of what to expect when I get to my graph. Step two, we want to find the y-intercept. Your y-intercept is f of zero. So what you're doing is you're substituting in zero for every x. So we would have one fourth times zero minus one times zero minus four times zero plus two. Simplify those and you have one fourth times negative one times negative four times two. Multiply all those together and you get two, which tells us that our y-intercept is the point zero, two. Now, step three. Step three is determining the real zeros of f and their multiplicities. This is already factored for us, so we use that zero product property to find those zeros. The first, x minus one equals zero. That gives us a zero of x equals one, which is the point one, zero. x minus four. That's a value of x equals 4 or an x-intercept of 4, 0. And our last one, x plus 2 equals 0. This is x equals negative 2, which is the point negative 2, 0. Notice each of these factors does not have an exponent, so they have multiplicity of 1. And remember, a multiplicity that is odd, they cross. So these are all going to be crossing points. Step four, 
we plot those x and y intercepts. Let's plot the y intercept first. There, it's 0, 2. Plot our x intercepts 1, 0, 4, 0, and negative 2, 0. Now we can draw the sketch starting from the left end behavior, and then we can do the right end behavior. And we know what happens at each of these. Remember, they cross. So we're crossing here, we're crossing here, and we're crossing here. So we know our left end behavior is down, and we know our right end behavior is up. And then we can connect the dots in between. Notice that step six, you can plot even more points if you want greater accuracy to your graph. Here, we don't really need that. We just want a general shape. So there's the general shape of our h of x function. If you want a perfect graph, pick some values for x, plug them into that function, and find the corresponding y coordinate, and you have your point. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video helpful, and I hope that you'll check out some of my other math videos.